session, I'd now like to welcome uh, Associate Professor uh, Bruno Machatelli uh, from Kuhnberg University. Bruno is also the President of the Contemporary European Studies Association of Australia. And it's Bruno who's going to pick up on the question that people have alluded to a number of occasions about the cheese, and that might allow for time to come back and pick up some of these issues that are brought to the Welcome, Bruno. Are you using PowerPoint or what is Thanks, Monish, and uh, it's wonderful to be on the same platform as my colleagues that have been working with the European space for quite some time. Thank you for your attention this morning. Um, uh, I've been given a topic uh, which uh, you're laughing because you know it's true. I've been given a topic. <laughs> Uh, uh, which um, uh, I'm sure there are many other experts uh, in the room that uh, may wish to offer public views. Uh, as, as I've been listening for a few minutes, uh, you've got a tremendous amount of agreement <coughs> on uh, many issues related to, to Europe, and I expect that by the end of this one there'll be even more discussion today and uh, uh, different views on uh, the whole question of migration, refugees, and others that. Uh, that um, I'll just briefly touch on. This is a little bit of what I'd like to, to touch on uh, this morning. And please, um, uh, most of what I'm going to say is um, quite controversial. Uh, and I'll probably try and concentrate more on that in order for you to feel that um, you know, these are things that you that might have opinions on. And uh, frankly, uh, there are many different views of uh, most of these issues that I'll just briefly touch on, and certainly this is not an exhaustive uh, account of it. But um, migration, of course, is international. I'm a product of it, like probably many of you. And as you can see from my, my surname, um, I'll probably give you a few examples from the Italian experience, and not only as an Italian Australian, but I've actually lived in Italy for nearly 20 years. Uh, and I saw the migration issue pretty vividly. Uh, it wasn't too difficult. Uh, all I needed to do was to go walk past them, any police station uh, from 5 o'clock in the morning and there were all black faces lining up uh, and normally they would shut the line at about 8 o'clock and anyone that came after 8 o'clock would probably have to come back. Uh, now this is after they have been queuing up for two or three hours uh, and let me tell you also the experience uh, that before I acquired Italian citizenship I did have to get a visa. Uh, in those days uh, there was not the EU structure uh, and the the Schengen arrangements were not, uh, not in place, but I'd never seen such levels of uh, blatant uh, racism, <coughs> open public, uh, that I experienced in Italy. And I'm not too sure that Italy was on its own. There were the more civil societies uh, that uh, superficially might present a view of uh, access to, to migration or to a visa, such as the UK, um, but France, Italy, Spain, Greece, Portugal, uh, and, and others who probably have very similar uh, approaches towards the complete contempt. And let me tell you that I also witnessed, on many occasions, uh, throwing passports in the faces physically, so that actually you pull them like that, and uh, and you know there'd be kind of, of course, a sense of aggression, um, but it gives you that sense of that that cultural uh, clash. Uh, and hostility, grappling with the whole question of migration, that, in my view, is still there today. Um, so I'd like to touch on different aspects of it, uh, including uh, uh, a little bit of the, just the theory. We, us uh, academics, sometimes uh, try and confuse people with a bit of theory. And, uh, and then at the end of it, we all say, well, you know what, at the end of the day, we're not too sure if it's helped or hindered us uh, in understanding a particular scenario. Um, uh, Migration in Europe is two different kinds of migration, well actually more than two, but there's certainly inter between European member states and of course from the outside uh, as well. And it's becoming a lot more uh, interesting in terms of its scenario. And there's also different forms of migration, including return migration. And believe it or not, return migration uh, can actually be quite significant in many different scenarios. Uh, I'm just currently doing some work on German return migration uh, and it's far more significant than I ever thought. Uh, and German migration, of course, is particularly complex because of shifting borders, because of east-west, uh, and a number of 
other factors, including the economy. Um, but now migration is in your face. It's, uh, it's high profile, it's very volatile, emotive, uh, and is actually redrawing many of the, the body politic of, of Europe. And Greece is certainly an example of that uh, in the last 12 months, uh, where it's become uh, pretty nasty. Um, I'd also like to look a little bit about uh, the asylum seekers and, and also in particular a couple of case studies, if you want to call it a case study, in relation to uh, the Roman Gypsy case where I have done a little bit of work um, uh, in terms of all, uh, academic, uh, academic work uh, papers and so on. Um, look, at the end of the day, there are many different approaches towards trying to understand migration. Uh, one of the important things uh, that uh, made uh, an understanding and providing theoretical models of it uh, was that it was very hard to measure. Uh, the ability to even collect data uh, was not particularly scientific or unison. Uh, this has been significantly improved in the last, uh, in the last generation, let's say, last 20 years. Uh, and of course there are many uh, separate discipline forms of drivers of migration and of course interdisciplinary ideas of how uh, it uh, can be uh, understood and measured. Um, but in some cases, it may be that uh, we are not uh, at all helped uh, by uh, this particular angle. And so I'm going to uh, move on, but allow you the possibility of looking uh, at that uh, <coughs> approach uh, in your own time. By the way, if you do have any uh, uh, questions you'd like to ask during the presentation, feel free. Um, I'm, um, sometimes I get a bit tired listening to myself too. Um, okay, migration is pretty international. We see it from a, an Australian perspective, which I would argue is extremely partial. Uh, and of course, as you know, uh, the boat people or the, uh, uh, the you know, asylum seekers, an Australian case study uh, is a bizarre uh, manner, I would say, which uh, is, um, uh, has managed to uh, monopolize debate in Australia. Uh, when uh, in reality I'd probably say that the 90 year old student, uh, on student uh, enrollment in universities is probably the clearest statement I've seen on Australian migration, even though it's not called that, uh, but it's simply uh, the new approach towards international students. If you go and look at the numbers, we're talking literally a new migration program. But that's not my thing today. Um, the, the overall macro picture of migration is quite significant. Uh, in terms of the amount of people that are out of their uh, uh, homeland uh, and are residing elsewhere and uh, otherwise uh, recognized as migrants. And uh, Europe plays a uh, particularly strong role in that uh, area, uh, which is why this would be uh, a theme on the, at this particular uh, school. Uh, and I can, uh, I can certainly attest to its importance, and including if we don't look at the former Soviet Union, but, and especially the <coughs> states of the former Soviet Union that are uh, not part of uh, the uh, current uh, European Union. So Europe is a major player, and especially uh, after the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, even more so. Um, just some very quick observations. Uh, most of our views are concentrated on a post-Second World War analysis. And, uh, and of course you need to remember the tremendous displacement that the Second World War created in terms of people, uh, redrawing of borders, boundaries, uh, the, uh, the creation of uh, the displaced peoples in many different scenarios, and not just in the obvious border areas. Uh, of course the uh, Jewish uh, displacement uh, and subsequently the creation of, the, of Israel uh, and in many other circumstances where migration was an obligatory uh, requirement, and much of which then we in Australia begin to see some of the results of that, uh, and especially the post-war uh, migration program of 1947. Um, moreover, uh, foreign-born uh, peoples are becoming a major factor in each country, and we'll see some, some data on that which uh, also makes the, the scenario Interesting. Here's an example of it, which I picked up from, uh, I think it's probably from uh, BBC, maybe, I'm not sure, I think I missed it. 
Um, you can see EU states with the biggest populations of people born in another EU member state. It's 2011, it's quite recent. Uh, and so Germany uh, is way up there. Uh, moving around, uh, Germany thought of as a country of uh, 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 just being very static, and in reality is a major player in that, uh, and way down to uh, the smaller level of, uh, of Ireland. Uh, in relation to that, if we, if we look at a little bit of the history, uh, we could have, going back three or four decades ago, uh, referred to the the migration uh, or the immigration countries and the emigration countries uh, within the European Union. And they were very starkly sort of separated. Uh, much of the immigration obviously related to uh, both uh, economic prospects, uh, very much affected the Mediterranean uh, uh, area, uh, and uh, a little lesser in the uh, North Europe, Ireland, and the UK. Much of that we also are familiar with. Um, the destinations that uh, many European migrants uh, are located themselves to uh, are also probably well known that the Americas would have been uh, up, way up there. Uh, other European countries, uh, again for work prospects, and we're familiar with the massive movement of, of Spanish, Portuguese, Italians, Greeks to other um, more uh, stronger economy based uh, states in, the, in Europe and therefore within reach, and also an, an important factor, that uh, locations where you think you'll come back home to, meaning you won't stay there forever. Uh, migration to the Americas, to Australia, often uh, would mean uh, return, uh, not non-return, and that uh, you might come to permanent residence. But within Europe, uh, it was seen as a short-term uh, resolution to particular economic difficulties of your country, your locality, or your village, your city. Um, but then later on, uh, this in fact uh, changed, and we start to see uh, immigration, uh, sorry, emigration countries uh, be begin to uh, become uh, immigration countries. I initially they sent out their people, and then they started to receive uh, migrants from other countries. Now that <coughs> transition is actually very tough for many of these countries to deal with. Uh, in fact, I'd say that in many cases uh, has not been resolved. Uh, in fact, a long way to be resolved. Uh, it's the transition from immigration, uh, from immigration to immigration. Certainly, in the case that I've had a lot of attention to uh, in relation to Italy, uh, is um, I would say tinged with hostility, uh, invasion, a uh, sense of I've been invaded. Uh, competition for <coughs> economic resources. Uh, now we're starting to see um, matters related to education, uh, the di difficulty in dealing with new communities, and of course, if you watch, if you want to put this in the multiculturalism category, uh, cases of, of course, the uh, emergence or the arrival of block groups of people from a certain religion or a certain cultural background starting to, uh, let's say, establish uh, their presence and the local authorities are doing their best to not uh, permit it. Um, a wonderful example, and I'll deal with this in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, in Milan, uh, there have been numerous requests from the Muslim communities to uh, establish, create, build uh, mosques. Generally, these have been declined in some respects with the Milan authorities being uh, either xenophobic uh, led by particular parties uh, or simply uh, conservative. Uh, this has led to prayer on Friday in the middle of the streets. Uh, and if it's a busy street, <laughs> it's actually quite a scene. And it just goes on week after week, uh, years. And so that's what I mean by struggling with the presence and dealing with new communities uh, that believe that their rights should actually be um, respected. Um, there are, of course, economic uh, matter issues. Uh, in fact, I would say they're probably the, the strongest uh, in relation to the movement of people uh, in Europe. And we saw the, the classic case of the Gustav Eiter uh, uh, scenario 
uh, of the basically limited residents uh, of uh, peoples <coughs> from uh, Turkey, but also other areas in Europe. And here we start to touch on the legalities, which I don't have the time to talk about citizenship and, and uh, visa to some extent will, will come up under the Schengen point that I'll make. But um, much of the legal structure of migration, in fact, is very uh, undeveloped. And uh, most of this area, in fact, remains in the hands of the member states. And for that reason, we'll see that, uh, first of all, the member states do not have the same approach. There are the, the soft and the hard cases in terms of permission, uh, and the legal structure is very, very different uh, in, uh, in terms of its approach. Some of this, of course, has been uh, combined and put into a unison approach in relation to Schengen, and that's, uh, that's been very important. But in particular, when it comes to the citizenship area, that's a different uh, kettle of uh, fish. Um, here you see uh, in a graphic uh, the kind of popular movements or the mass movements that have been going on. Uh, one of the interesting things about Europe, of course, is that while um, uh, it, there might be pretty tough uh, border checks, there are also a lot of soft borders. And so uh, with a lot of initiative, many people can actually make their way around uh, and try and get into the locations that, uh, uh, that uh, they desire. Much of it can be uh, transitional, meaning places where you're actually not going to stay. Italy is a transition location. Uh, it's known to most migrants that there's not a lot going for you, and therefore it's really the soft entry and we'll have a look at a couple of slides on what the soft equity might be. Uh, but then going to weather places where there's some greater guarantee of integration, work, uh, and, um, uh, and some kind of future prospect. Um, in the last period, uh, the migration has continued both within Europe uh, and uh, from out. Uh, we see some interesting um, uh, developments and I'll put this up as a slide in a moment as a graph so you'll get a better idea, but I'm just, in fact, I might just do that and talk to it. Um, you'll see that the, the top 10 of the immigrants uh, uh, that are moving around within the 27 member states, uh, in fact, uh, not surprisingly, have come from the new 2004 accession of the Eastern Central European countries, Romania, uh, Poland, Bulgaria, each one of those cases probably has a national kind of joke about it, and Poland, of course, is connected to the UK. The Romania, a little bit more to, to uh, Italy, Spain, um, and Bulgaria the same. So we, we, there is a lot of movement going on within the communities that are part of the European Union. When the 2004 uh, enlargement occurred, one of the uh, fears, of course, was, oh, geez, now we're going to have this was very much the case, uh, the figure in the UK will be uh, completely flooded by Eastern European uh, migrants. And, and of course, a whole culture develops and the media goes berserk and the British media is not well known for <coughs> telling a lot of truth. Um, and um, and I'll just as a couple of headlines, I mean, they're, they're pretty good um, in terms of the scandal mongering and the trying to render something very um, uh, dramatic and so on. Uh, but, even, but there were the jokes about the, the polls um, becoming your electrician, your plumber, and <laughs> so on and so forth. But frankly, if that was the case, that's actually an improvement. Of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, and in actual fact, I think when the statistics came out after 2004, and let's say around about 2006, I don't remember the exact date, but I think 1% of people moved around. Uh, as a result of the accession of 2004. You've got to remember there was this fear of a tremendous amount of unevenness within the European Union, and particularly Eastern Europe and Central Europe were uh, not particularly well developed. The, the Polish economy, for example, is, was and still is. 40% uh, of its GDP is agriculture. Now, there aren't many countries in the world, Australia is 1.7% 1, 1. of agriculture, just to give you an idea. So, and France is 10%. Um, so you're kind of thinking, guess what, they're going to go to the big cities and the UK was actually quite open uh, in uh, not putting up any kind of stumbling blocks in relation to it. And, and while it would seem that, she, uh, that, the, that the EU free movement of people should have applied, uh, we will probably see that there were people 
exceptions to that. In terms of the top 10 from outside of Europe, going into the countries of the European Union, uh, Morocco, uh, the, based on the statistics from Eurostat, uh, way out in front. Um, interesting one is China. And I was surprised to see that the, the greatest number of Chinese, and by the way, keep an eye on that figure, it'll probably end up overtaking Morocco in five years. 27% um, of the Chinese entry went to Spain. Um, a lot more even. Um, this is sort of data around about, I think, yeah, 2 age. Um, and it might be that that's slightly changed and become a lot more flattened. Because um, the presence of, of Chinese immigrants in Europe, in mean, five years alone, I don't know if you found out, but certainly in Italy, five years alone. It, I mean, you know, I often go back to Italy to do my own research, and I go to hotels, and you know, one time the Italians running, and the next time the Chinese running. Uh, and the service is actually improved. Um, <laughs> so, 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 in actual fact, you can, you can, you can visually see, you can see it. Okay. It's in your face. There are whole industrial districts of, in Italy which are a concentration of, of industries that are now run by Chinese. The Right. Perfect. That's a perfect one. Please. Um, what I find interesting when it comes to Chinese migration, and not just in Europe, but I've seen this as well in Latin America, is how Chinese migration seems to have less there seems to be less controversy, less issue with it than what there is with, say, migration from, you know, poorer Eastern European nations or from um, Arabic nations as well. So it's, it's very interesting and it's, it's a good point that you've made and I reckon it will keep going and will it, with the increase in Chinese migration to EU states, does that mean that, is it, is it now going to become a controversial topic now? Will it grow that, oh, there's so many Chinese people here, is it, they're taking our jobs, they're taking our money. Will it, do you reckon it will become that one day? I actually think it's already there. Uh, not every country is reflecting it uh, in a, such an open way. But if I go back to, uh, I don't think France is any different, but Italy, there is a, there is a siege mentality that Chinese have destroyed our country. No. And in some small areas, it's true. Perfect example of profit, not just profit. The furniture making area, it's gone, finished. Textiles. Uh, shoes, textiles, they're gone. That's globalization. Absolutely. But it's also behind. Absolutely. But it's also behind a very powerful player. And uh, two years ago, I brought a study to it, to a shoe factory, high level shoe factory, just for the, for the students to get an idea of the kind of supply chain that goes on in an industrial scenario. And uh, I asked the, um, the owner of the, of the company if he would give a presentation. And this guy's man, he just, he just attacked China. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, and, and, I, and after I, we finished the presentation, I had to say to the students, now hold on, there's some truth in what he's saying, but obviously this guy has been personally affected by the competition. And having, having thought about this about 10 years ago, it was, it was it was on the radar screen, but everyone ignored it. And they said, you know what? We don't have to worry about China because we are placing our product in a different segment. I, we're not going to compete with trash, was their view. But you think China just sits there and does trash? Yeah. It does other things. Yeah. So uh, I actually think this happened. And the second example, to, sh to tell you that I think that the tension is there, Milan had a nasty confrontation between the Chinese community and to the extent that there was a, uh, I don't know if you remember the old 1960s and 70s when there'd be the city riots in the United States, okay, the Chinese all blocked together and they had a flag. That was the People's Republic. It was here. Sorry? It was here also. Yeah, really? I didn't know that. From the, the film festival. When the Chinese were talking to the, With the way the film was being presented. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Yes. The website was hacked and so, shut down. Yes. So I actually think that it's there, but there is a big difference. Is that the Chinese migrants are clearly supported by their government. That's not the case with many other migrant communities. 
they, they sit out there in a host lane country and you know they have to do their best. Not here. Um, so I, I was quite impressed. And then when you get the ambassador, go on national television and say, this is unacceptable, the Italian authorities should not have allowed this to happen, blah, blah, blah. Complete defense of their community. Yeah. So I think the tension will occur, and you remember, China is still pumping out the economic, their economic benefits, and just look at everybody's trade with China. Literally every country, their number one trading partner, it's with some exceptions yeah. in the European Union, is China, 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 China. So you think it's just a matter of time, basically? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It'll be interesting when yeah. it does come to him. And to hear young Chinese kids in the streets of Rome with mm. a Roman accent is... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen, it's hilarious. I've seen yeah. it. With their, we have family in Argentina and they don't like their local Chinese um, supermarket. Yes, and it's, it's very strange. They see it as a threat. Argentinian, Argentinian Spanish from a Chinese person. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the Italians in uh, in Argentina, are, uh, you know, I think it's one in three yeah. is, uh, yeah. is uh, of Italian ancestry. You know. So, on. can I add it as well? I'm interning at the Italian Chamber of Commerce at the moment, and we're trying to introduce an Italian. We're bringing in buy emissions from Australia into Italy to import product, and that's one of our huge obstacles at the moment. Trying to get Italian companies to actually import now one of the big problems and like to export now and trying to compete in a market with goods that are cheaper is our biggest obstacle. Um, I, I also think that many countries in uh, many member states in Europe, um, and this is where Australia strangely enough shines, know how to do business with China. Most European businessmen are still wearing the arrogant hat. We know best. And the, if, you, if you happen to be, I do a lot of traveling now in China because of my job. I, you're, at, you're at breakfast time in a hotel, you see all the delegations come in from wherever, and I always pay attention to the Italian symbol because it's a bit of a sticky nose. And just the arrogance that there is with their translators and with the, the business partners that they've got in China, I just say, how can you do business with China like that? You tell me. I can just see it in your body language. Australia is, a, is far more adept to understanding that. Probably, you know, we sort of pounded into them, and, um, <coughs> uh, and I think they've um, they've benefited. Um, you know, with China, you know, self-respect and re reciprocity is critical uh, in terms of doing any kind of dialogue. Look, time's running out. I might try and move on to um, some of the critical issues that um, that are cropping up. Uh, which relate to refugees and other communities. And, okay, here you are. This is the they, the Telegraph in you know, in uh, the UK. Uh, already still continuing to hit that nail on Eastern Europe invasion, and the uh, the difficulty that this will bring to the uh, British economy uh, in terms of greater levels of unemployment. Uh, and and of course one of the things that Britain's has always got this difficulty of dealing with Europe in any case. We'll see that in another front page title. Uh, that um, uh, I'll show vis-a-vis uh, -vis its, um, its view towards Europe. But that's the kind of picture that you'll see on the front page of a tabloid, uh, and it's very much in that kind of fear mode. Now, one of the areas that, um, that I came across is the, the fact that, and you see, if, you, if you're watching the news, or, uh, which relates to you know, the umpteenth <coughs> boat that arrives on whatever shores or um, You'll see uh, you slide later on in um, uh, Tunisian immigrants. <coughs> is the, the fact that the because uh, um, citizenship is a, a member state responsibility, uh, that um, refugee policy or asylum, refugee and asylum policy is also effectively a member state, um, and the visa uh, implementation is, yes, it's under Schengen, but at the same time, many member states have decided to take the law into their own hands and do their own thing. Um, there seems to be some kind of break, gap, difference between the policy, which is very rigid, and the attitude of the local communities that then become the recipients of the migrants. 
And these become really kind of sad stories. It almost says to me that the policy and the government are in one world, and the people can see the misery, the horrible conditions that they arrive in, and kind of NGOs just take over. But you, can, you can't do that forever. But they do. And um, the, the, the local communities take on the responsibility of the integration of these poor migrants who barely with what they're wearing, uh, and, and certainly in some of the scenarios of Greece and Italy, uh, we're talking people who maybe just barely survived a, uh, a trip, uh, either on water uh, or uh, some other um, dangerous way. So I think there's a very much a, uh, at some levels of NGOs, there's a greater sense of civic duty uh, of wanting to help of understanding that Italians or Greeks might have been in exactly the same situation some generations before, um, and that there had to be some kind of uh, understanding. Labor schools, quite clearly uh, the area where there is movement. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, the EU blue card approach, but even the approach towards student mobility, uh, and Australians follow exactly the same. In fact, I think that's where they got the idea from. Um, that the whole question of getting the right, quote, the right people uh, is what uh, the governments are looking for. Uh, but indirectly, they're saying we're actually getting the wrong people. And so you've got that clash that's going on. Of course, the global financial crisis and the ongoing Eurozone crisis, which is not going to go away. Certain, I'll, I'll be retired, I think. Yeah, I think Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. By the time? So, so uh, uh, it'll, um, thank you. Uh, I'll be retired. So, look, uh, watch that space because it'll be there for a long time. And that makes, that changes the, the migration pattern uh, uh, quite quite significantly. If I've got, uh, what was it, 30 minutes, you said? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. One of the consequences, and boy, if you look at Greece right now. One of the consequences of um, the question of economic difficulties uh, is to take it out on the weaker element, migrant, migrants very much. And every country's got their migrants. Huh? They've got, they got their group of the hate list. And this is what happens with the growth, massive growth of right-wing parties. Uh, street, part, street parties, I mean, street fighting parties, not just uh, the respectable ones in Parliament. Uh, and in the case of Spain, uh, they claim they're doing very well in recruitment. And remember, they've got a very uh, close past you know, in terms of potential uh, growth. But every country seems to have its own, and they look at the size of it, they're not small. Australia doesn't have it, so you kind of live in a little bubble where you think that these things don't occur. And I don't believe that any country in Europe uh, over an extended period of time, we'll be, we'll be approaching the very dangerous situation that we saw in Italy in the 1920s or in Germany in the 1930s. That Greece is getting there quickly. Because when the New Dawn Party starts to, and by the way, they're all very nice and respectable. I don't know if you, they got their street kids, <laughs> the street fighting kids in the background, and they got their respectable ones who sit in the parliament. And they've got their Bulgarians and Albanians that they're going to bash up when they get the opportunity. That's when you know over a long period of time and there's no prospect for work, and in fact the situation is worse than even you thought, then you start to touch the rotation of history. Watch that space. And every other country, in fact, I was surprised that um, there wasn't much more done on the National Front and also the Northern Leagues. Um, recently a football match just north of Milan, yet again, a black player gets a whole curva sud or curva nord, whatever it was, gets into their usual tantrum, uh, racist tantrum, and this is just going on and on. Milan, as a football club, not surprisingly, because probably half of the players now are black, <laughs> um, walked off. And this is just a football match at 20 <coughs> kilometers. So this, unfortunately, is one of the consequences of a tough melting pot of migrants, difficult economic circumstances, and a history of 
uh, of uh, potential uh, rocket fuel. At the same time, you're also getting the arrival of many uh, Muslim communities, uh, some of which I addressed before. And the larger circles, of course, relate to the size of them in particular countries. But they're getting quite significant, particularly in areas uh, where the economies have been uh, traditionally stronger. Uh, and that, of course, uh, has been heightened in terms of the tension uh, ever since the uh, Twin Towers uh, episode. Um, this is uh, here, soft border, unofficial arrival of immigrants to Italy. Wonderful boat. Uh, there's probably over 100 and, 100 and something there. Who knows where it came from? Uh, yes, a few years ago, but this is just ongoing. Uh, and so uh, I'd say probably, I mean, I, I don't have the, the figures anymore, but uh, a one week's arrival of boat, uh, boat um, uh, arrivals in Italy is equal to one year in Australia. Um, okay, asylum seekers, and I need to finish up uh, very soon, but this has been an area where the European Union has really backtracked. Um, it's uh, taken positions of wanting to uh, unilaterally uh, step back, uh, even in some cases sabotage, and certainly not meet uh, their uh, what you might call geographical um, quota. Uh, and, uh, and this becomes an item of tremendous confrontation within the nation state. And, uh, and of course then you get the politics around it, the backlash, uh, the hostility towards immigrants. Uh, you know, you are the criminals, this place has now got uh, X percent of increase in criminality and theft and robbery and rape. And of course it's very easy to blame uh, the, uh, the asylum seekers and the and the new immigrants. And you can see uh, front page of a, uh, the Daily Express. Uh, but accidentally, look at that. Uh, Euro court drops Britain in it again. Yeah. Well, that's a beautiful statement on how, what, Euro, uh, what Britain thinks about the European Union. Um, <laughs> let me just finish on, uh, this is a wonderful slide on uh, a Tunisian uh, who obviously just landed in uh, probably Sicily. Uh, and uh, you know, if you, if you didn't see the modern attire, You'd almost think this is, you know, the 1940s in somewhere in Germany or Poland. Uh, I mean, that's the quality of it. You know, where are they all marching off to? Uh, some kind of camp somewhere. Uh, forget about airplanes and cars. Um, and uh, you know, whoever drops on the way, you know, it's just, you, you know, you can't get used to this. That's the danger. And just finishing up. Um, an area that I have done some work on, the gypsies, which Australia has very little uh, to deal with um, Roma uh, communities. Uh, in Europe, uh, they are there. And uh, very much France and uh, France, Italy, uh, in a very negative way. Sarkozy and Berlusconi uh, got used to uh, deporting them. By the way, many gypsies are actually nationals of the country they've just been, been deported from. That's a pretty interesting phenomenon. So you're Italian or French, and you get deported. Deported where? To Romania or something like that. Often the police just dump them across the border because it's too expensive. <laughs> it's too expensive. What do you do? You just go to Switzerland and <laughs> drive a kilometre into Switzerland. And, <laughs> and some of them have EU passports as well as oh, Romania. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I did, I did go and investigate why the, there was this problem why they could even, there was a loophole, and apparently the, the writing up of the agreement in relation to Romania and Bulgaria on entry was that the member states had a little bit more jurisdiction on the Romanians, which would have included many gypsies. But uh, this is just horrible stuff. And the European Union, the Commission, responded beautifully. And literally attacked Sarkozy in the following way, saying, this reminds us a little bit of what happened in the 1930s. Boy, Sarkozy went. <laughs> this was done by a commissioner, not by some you know lower level uh, EU um, uh, EU functionary. So uh, look, I think I probably raised more questions than answers, um, mainly because this is a you know work in progress issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Quick question. Please, 
situation. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, in, in the French Assembly, 12 members of Parliament from outside France, and I'm not talking the, the, the French territories, outside, now sit in the French Parliament. Italy started this back in 2001 with 18 members of Parliament. Now, we're very close to that because two of them come from Melbourne. And they sit in the Italian Parliament, and it's their way of connecting to the communities abroad. Why did they do this? Because they thought, okay, the, the Italians abroad thought that this was a way of lobbying their government for pension, TV, and language, you know, improvements and all those kind of things. Inside Italy, they thought this was a good thing, and I think the French were exactly the same, that this would be a lobbying and a, uh, and that politically it would probably uh, be very convenient to a particular party inside the home country. Sarkozy's party was very much in support of it, as was Berlusconi. But when they actually put it to the test, in both Frank, the French election and the Italian, they all voted centre left. I yeah. the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. Of what was expected. So guess what happens when a wonderful proposal is no longer giving you those advantages, you don't see it wonderful anymore. So now yeah, there's a bucket of water on this whole idea and everyone's trying to subdue it. Um, Italian elections are happening in four weeks time. They didn't get the chance to redo all of the legislation. So there will still be two representatives from the Australia electorate, who is much larger, larger than that, that will sit in the parliament in Rome. Last, last one, very quickly. Oh, it was just a comment that I've yet to actually go to Italy, but because I have an Italian passport, every four years I have to vote. Thankfully, you don't have to vote. Well, they, they you can send, vote. Well, that's what I'm saying. They send us the actual. That's correct. They, they still send us the things, and, and we do get the letter saying, "Dear, you know, Italians, please come back. It's amazing." So yeah, it, it continues to get that asked for. This particular question. Sorry, would you put your arm down? This particular question of uh, how do you treat your diaspora community? Is, is actually all goes back to one question, which is the legality, the citizenship laws. And do you have a predominantly what's called usori, meaning based on res a residency, or use sanguinis, the bloodline? And countries like Italy and many others, the bloodline, which is why you 
get called up because you weren't born in Italy, were you? Right. And do you speak Italian? I understand it. And okay. It. Now, no offence to you in any way, but look at the problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's an objective issue. How can you vote in an election and you don't speak the language? And I'm not talking about the 300,000 in Australia. I'm talking about the million and a half in Brazil or in Argentina. And by the way, their migration is 100 years ago. They don't speak Italian. In fact, one of the members of parliament did not speak Italian. Now, you're in parliament, you don't speak Italian. Excuse me. How are you going to vote? No one's going to translate for you. So, so they're all rethinking this. It's not a great idea. There was one gentleman who was a former prime minister of Italy, Amato, Giuliano Amato. Yes. And he said to me once, he said, I don't know what we're thinking when we vote. <laughs> that might be the point at which we do stop. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> a very stimulating session. Which we've been, again, we've said a couple of times we've already taken over three days just on, on that particular set of issues. But uh, thanks very much for our presenters. Thanks very much to you. Uh,